Okay, welcome to those of you that have just joined us. It's great to have you all this afternoon. Uh, we'll be getting started very shortly. We're just letting, giving people the opportunity to bypass through the lobby uh, and join us this afternoon. Brilliant. OK, so it looks like we have some more people joining us, which is great. Uh, so hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our seminar for teachers, uh, lobbying and legislating. This is hosted by UK Parliament and the Political Studies Association. So we're really excited to have you all with us today. Um, and we're really very much looking forward to hearing from our two fantastic speakers. So we have Dr Nikki Sue of the School of Journalism joining us. From the School of Journalism, Media and Culture at Cardiff University, and Chris Clark from the Legislation Office of the House of Lords. Okay, so my name is Rosie. I'm a member of the teacher training team uh, here at UK Parliament. Um, I'm sure we might have worked with some of you before, uh, but it's also lovely to have the opportunity to meet those of you joining us for the first time. So, our work is part of a wider offer. Um, offered by the UK Parliament Education and Engagement Team. As this includes an exciting programme of online sessions, award-winning resources and professional development. So the most re uh, recent development for teacher training um, are our brand new e-learning for teachers modules, which you can complete online uh, at your own pace and you'll receive a certificate of participation following that. So if you'd like to hear more about all the things that we can offer you to help you in your teaching and in your classroom, uh, please sign up to our newsletter, uh, which you can hear, you'll hear more about throughout the session um, and following the session as well. Um, I'm now going to hand over to James, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the Political Studies Association. Thank you, James. Hi, thank you. Um, so my name is Dr. James Weinberg. I'm a lecturer in political behaviour at the University of Sheffield. And I'm also the lead for schools, outreach and engagement at the Political Studies Association. And I want to welcome everyone who's currently on this call um, and especially welcome those of you who are teachers and have survived another day in the classroom during this incredibly difficult and challenging time for education. For those of you who don't know or might not already be members of the Political Studies Association, we're the largest learned society for political scientists, uh, people who are just simply interested in politics and anyone with cognate interests, either in the practical world of politics or inside the classroom in the UK. And we've now been running for over 70 years. Um, and we have a dedicated portfolio of resources and activities designed just for teachers in schools. Um, and if you want to access that, you can get a school's membership from the PSA for just 25 pounds. And that entitles you and anyone else in your school to access our resources, whether that's our seminars for schools program, where you can ask for an academic to come in and give a lecture or a speech about a certain topic and to discuss that with your students, whether it be our online repository of resources that are linked to curriculum topics, um, specifically those on the A-level politics curriculum. Um, we also run student competitions with YouGov and the Financial Times. And if you remember, your students can take part in those. And we have a whole host of free events going on throughout the year, like this webinar um, and others, such as uh, workshops for young people who are looking to study politics at university. And if you're a member, you get priority booking on those events. So I'd urge you, if you haven't already looked into it, to think about joining um, our organisation as, as a school's member. And my colleague Jamie's putting more information in the chat for you. We'd also be really keen to hear from you. Um, about things that the organisation could be doing so that we're more responsive to the needs of teachers around the country, especially at this um, difficult and challenging time. So whether you're a member or not, please feel free to get in touch with us, whether that's directly to me uh, or, or through the PSA and contact details are available on our website. We'd love to hear some ideas from you. But today um, we're delighted to be partnering with the Parliamentary Education Service again to deliver what is our second uh, online webinar of this lockdown period um, and today we're focusing on legislating and lobbying and we're thrilled to have Dr Nikki Sue from Cardiff University and Chris Clark from the House of Lords Legislation Committee 
to give what hopefully will be interesting and stimulating presentations for all of you uh, and provide you with some ideas as you go back to your schools and classrooms to deliver your own curricula. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Nikki Stu to give the first pres presentation, which is entitled um, Influencing Decisions, Media and Lobbying in Parliament. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, thanks so much, James. Um, I'm just going to share the screen really quickly and then we can begin. Okay, brilliant. Um, hi everyone, thanks so much to James for that great introduction. Uh, I'm a researcher at Cardiff University's uh, School of Journalism, Media and Culture. I mainly research political communication between representatives and members of the public. Um, I'm particularly interested in looking at the impact of digital technology um, and how they affect politics, media and society. So today I'll be talking a little bit about uh, media and politics, uh, sorry, media and lobbying from the perspectives of MPs. Um, and I'll be sharing some examples uh, from my fieldwork before uh, that I've carried out um, to illustrate how this process takes place uh, during day-to-day -day constituency service and uh, work um, and how this can and might differ from online and offline uh, experiences. So the importance of media and lobbying cannot be understated. Um, some examples of uh, successful uh, lobbying recently include Margaret Rashford, uh, Marcus Rashford's uh, campaign in June this year to continue free lunches during the summer. So it's often at election times that we tend to hear about these voices, uh, particularly from charities and different um, think tanks and institutions. And these matter a lot because they're well placed to spot um, unintended consequences um, of proposed changes to legislation and policies and are able to highlight the gaps that risk leaving sections of our society behind. But outside of election times, um, their presence in the political system helps ensure government accountability and make and help make important decisions that have sometimes been overlooked. Um, this can also be carried out um, in different ways, such as including online tools, such as social media and sites such as 30 degrees. So since influencing decision making involves so many different variables and can take place in a variety of ways, I thought I'd focus, like I said before, on um, the aspect, on the, sort of the everyday uh, interaction between MPs and the constituents and how this occurs then, uh, and what MPs think of it, uh, and the challenges that they might face uh, when making these de policy decisions and uh, with these in mind. So to illustrate what I mean, um, I thought I'd share some findings from field work that I actually carried out. Uh, from 2015 to 2017 for about 18 months. Um, this was a period where I did an ethnography and I looked at what MPs were doing in the constituency, particularly, um, especially like face-to-face -face, uh, activities such as surgeries, town hall meetings and walkabouts. I also carried out semi-structured interviews and I also collected a lot of different types of materials that MPs were disseminating. So this included traditional materials such as flyers, uh, posters, um, and social media and online materials that were like blog posts, anything that was members of the public. I also then did an, an in-depth analysis of interview transcripts. So what I'm hoping um, by sharing some of these details is that I will be able to give you some insight into how these representatives experience lobbying in an everyday perspective um, and their thoughts on this. So um, to be accessible to the constituents uh, so that they're able to share their concerns and issues really easily. Uh, this can be done in a variety of ways. And as I mentioned earlier, I did collect a lot of different types of materials. So on the left, you can see uh, two flyers that were given out by different MPs, one from Lib Dem, one from uh, a Labour MP. Um, and here they're really trying to encourage constituents to get in touch with them by listing the different ways that they can get in touch, uh, different times these surgeries and appointments are being held. Um, and for example, former MP for Oxford East at the bottom, actually his uh, flyer is also a type of free post. So uh, constituents can actually just write the problems directly on that flyer and just put it in the mailbox at no cost to them at all. So they're really trying to minimize that distance between the constituent and the MP. Um, on the left, oh, sorry, on the right, um, Peter Carl MP, who represents Hove, 
actually tries to do this really physically by actually having his constituency office on the high street of Hove so that constituents can just drop by whenever they wanted as part of their everyday process to talk about anything they were concerned with. So when I was shadowing um, him, I actually got to observe this in real life where constituents who might not have had um, an appointment could actually drop by and tell them they were concerned about a hospital closing or um, a GP surgery closing down near where they were living and things like that. And um, again, really be able to bring up their concerns um, in an everyday kind of situation. And again, to raise uh, policy questions that they might have. As we have grown to use various platforms and digital technologies to connect with our own friends and networks in our everyday lives, so have MPs. So the accessibility has then been extended to the realm of online tools such as social media. Um, this is particularly important um, at this critical period of the pandemic where constituents and MPs are actually not able to meet face to face as they would in the examples I've just shown you earlier. Um, but in fact have had to kind of harness these online tools to make that connection. So these include the use of Twitter and Facebook. Um, and here we have some examples of MPs on Facebook. Um, on the front, we've got Robert Health, an MP who represents Harlem and Essex. And again, uh, we have an example of a policy issue on the left uh, from Peter Kyle that he wrote just a couple of weeks ago um, about cycling lanes uh, being introduced in Brighton and Hove to encourage environmentally friendly um, modes of transport. So he actually received almost 900 comments um, that engaged with his post. He, he wrote something quite lengthy to express um, his thoughts about why it was important, but understood that it was something that might affect other people's lives, including car drivers. Um, during my time shadowing him, he actually did express how he felt like this was a really important avenue for him to connect with his constituents, to hear about how they were feeling and um, have them feedback about their policies in greater numbers. But at the same time, um, he was also aware that these views only represented a small group of the public and was very cautious to say those 900 people said this and therefore everyone in Hove must have felt the same way. Um, similarly, a lot of the MPs that I did shadow, um, which I should have mentioned before, I shadowed 10, um, they did express the sort of concern that a lot of, whilst using social media was a great way to engage and hear about policy concerns and issues, um, there was a sense that they had to be careful not to generalize the finding from these because you know what about the people they didn't hear from and things like that. Um, more and more MPs are also inundated by letters and emails from those uh, by mass campaign sites such as 38 degrees uh, and change.org uh, but petitions are actually also now being able to be made directly with the government um, using uh, sorry, so we can create and sign a petition um, to ask for a change to the law and uh, government policy, which I understand is a bit more preferred uh, to the MPs I've spoken to now. So after 10,000 signatures, petitions can get a response from government, and after 100,000 signatures, then these petitions are then considered for debate in Parliament. So from my research field, it was actually really clear that um, out of all the different ways that I've just mentioned that MPs could hear about policy concerns from their constituents uh, and members of the public, their preference was to hear directly from constituents. Uh, and importantly for them to actually raise, you know, important legislation to them, uh, either in a letter or hearing face to face, it was paramount for them to note it down as they were hearing it on their walkout and things like that. So from the Conservative MP's quote um, on this slide, he actually mentioned how you've got to speak to as many people as possible to be effective. You have to really appreciate what their concerns are and, you know, allow them to understand that they could influence decision making by sharing these thoughts with you. Um, and he acknowledges that these immediate problems are affecting their day to day lives. And one of the things that really emerged uh, from my experiences shadowing them was that MPs were very concerned with what was happening with constituents everyday lives because they were actually reflective, a reflection of what was happening um, with, you know, policies that were actually being made on a more macro level, but they were experiencing what was the after effects of these policies being made and they could then actually reflect and report back on how that was affecting their 
Um, similar for the Labour MP quote at bottom, um, people do raise things and I note them all down. And everything that's being raised is followed up with an issue and action, so a letter in action. So again, very important to them to actually hear about it because they would like to be able to engage with it further. But what about those people who connect with them online? Um, one of the things that I actually did ask about during uh, my time shadowing them and interviewing the MPs was how they felt about online petition sites such as 38 Degrees. Um, there was a general concern that it was a good way for people to express their thoughts, but there might be a disconnect between those who sign up on these petition sites and those who actually um, whose lived experiences these actual petitions do um, impact. So one of the main things that was a concern for some of the MPs was that you hear a lot or you get flooded in your inbox, but then you don't actually hear about the specific issues um, from their own personal point of view because it is a template letter that they are receiving. So they don't really have an idea of how much they're actually being affected um, in this collectivism style of support, uh, showing support for issues. Um, so they don't really find this necessarily a very good or useful form of engagement because they receive a template letter and then they then often send a fairly standard reply back. So resulting in an exchange that's not necessarily incredibly meaningful and impacts uh, policy in the long run. Um, there was also some concerns being raised uh, that it could then, you know, be using up resources that could then be directed to more pressing policy issues raised by other members of the public. So for instance, um, you can see here in these MPs quotes is that they do say that it's quite a large number, they flood their um, MP boxes, but they have to bear in mind that it doesn't necessarily reflect um, everybody. And interestingly, we have another MP, the Labour MP at the bottom, who does reflect a slightly different view, which says, you know, I'm happy for them to get in touch with me because I will have a way of getting back in touch with them in the future, even if it's not necessarily something that I can um, really do anything about if it's a big problem with a very standard email. Um, but if they care about it and I respond to them really quickly, then people then tend to get quite impressed. So he, he uses that as an opportunity to get in touch with them. Um, just on a point about, going back to the point about directing resources away from those or, uh, or directing attention away from problems. Um, this con this, these sentiments actually echo those who do work in social change. So for instance, um, a 2013 report uh, by those from the Social Change Agency actually found that the new methods like these online petition sites um, of online campaigning such as email your MP tactics um, tend to drown out some of the most marginalized people. And this does continue to be a concern for MPs, particularly when they are aware that those who are most marginalized do not necessarily have the means or knowledge uh, on, on how to raise their concerns. So, yeah, um, and finally, I'd like to discuss some of the challenges might also, that might also impede um, the influence that uh, these decision making would can take place, uh, not necessarily intentionally, but due to challenges faced by those who do make them. So uh, firstly, it's just the sheer volume of demands, um, especially across platform and activities. Um, as we mentioned earlier before, you know, there are in, their inboxes are being flooded. So just to give you an example of how the amount of correspondence MPs receive from constituents have increased dramatically. Um, since the 2010s, MPs receive an average of approximately 29,000 emails, 12,000 letters and 6,000 calls a year. So having that one person and you know usually three or four caseworkers having to address all that can be quite demanding. Um, along with these demands are also this, this balancing act that the MP has to do between responsibilities um, in Parliament and issues being raised. So this includes managing resources such as time and budget in order to evaluate the policies and issues that are being uh, discussed so that they're assessed not just by metrics, like how many people are actually telling you it's a problem, but actually by impact as well. Furthermore, despite um, the importance of issues being discussed, if it's a national petition, often MPs um, don't necessarily are aren't necessarily able to address them because they, their role tends to be um, 
priority, you know, prioritizing their constituents. And as such, they're not necessarily able to do anything about that. And lastly, um, there is no backup MP should health or personal problems emerge. Um, James's research actually has identified factors uh, on this before and how it could threaten the mental health of MPs in their, whilst they're carrying out this role because there's so many demands being made of them. Um, this includes increasing expectations on what they have to achieve for the public whilst under great public scrutiny. So there's a lot to think about, I think, when it comes to like media and well-being. Um, MPs, especially in how it affects them on a daily basis. So thank you so much for your time um, and I look forward to your questions. Brilliant. Um, thank you ever so much, Nikki. That was a great presentation um, and I particularly enjoyed listening to some of your um, thoughts about how and why MPs particularly struggle when it comes <laughs> to communicating effectively um, either with their constituents or vice versa. So we're going to pass on now to Chris Clark, who um, is a member of the House of Lords Legislation Committee, um, and he's going to provide you with some expert guidance on uh, this topic. So take it away, Chris. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, good, I'm taking that as um, you can hear me. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I really want everybody to stay on the call, but I will promise you this is a pretty esoteric um, topic, um, the legislative process in the House of Lords. So hang in there, and I promise there'll be something for everyone, um, and I look forward to your questions. So I'm now going to attempt to share my screen. I've got some PowerPoint slides. Um, in an ideal world, um, and the world's far from ideal at the moment, I would have... Um, had some time to pare them down a little bit so I'm going to have to race through them fairly fairly quickly and if you um and don't worry it, it is pretty um esoteric some of it but um, I'll try and make it as um, as exciting as I possibly can um okay I'm just going to share my screen with you okay very good that seems to have worked which um is remarkable in itself Okay, so my name is Chris. I've been working in the House of Lords um, for over 15 years. I've done lots and lots of different things. Um, I'm clerk of select committees in the committee office at the moment, but I've also been in the legislation office for um, two or three years, a couple of years back. Um, so without further ado, I'll skip through these slides and then uh, let's get to questions as soon as we can, because I tend to think that's always the most useful part of these exercises. Um, so these are some of the questions that we're going to be thinking about um, for the next 15 20 minutes who makes the law what is an act what is a bill um apologies if this is all too um simple simple for you because you're all um as i understand it have some expertise in this area um so i'll go to my next slide so if we're thinking about bills and the legislative progress process bills become acts which are laws so a bill is basically a draft law. Um, sometimes bills are published in draft form before they're published as bills, um, but that's not um, too frequent, but that's something we can return to. Um, but there's lots of different species of bills, um, and it's quite confusing. Most bills are government bills, and they're called public bills because they apply to everybody. Um, and the government sets out um, their programme of bills in the Queen's speech at the state opening of Parliament, um, each year, although the regularity of that's been a little bit um, more unsettled, um, if I can put it that, like that, um, over recent years. So they're the, they're the kind of meat and drink of the legislative process, it's government bills. Um, and then there's also private members' bills. And what those bills are is they're bills proposed by usually backbench MPs or backbench peers. They're given a little bit of time on the floor of both houses to make their way through the legislative process, but not many become law. Um, lots of them are published as a kind of barometer, as a kind of exercise in flying a kite to try and get an issue on the agenda. Um, although having said that, some very significant pieces of legislation over the last 50, 60 years have been private members' bills. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that the, the Abortion Act um, 67 was a private members' bill. And then there's draft bills, which, as I mentioned previously, some bills are published in draft before they're introduced to one of the two houses. 
And that's usually an exercise in the government trying to work out if they've got a very knotty um, policy area. Um, it gives them a kind of extra round of consultation and discussion to try and thrash out what they want to, what they want to achieve. Um, private bills, I probably won't go into too much. Um, and they are different to private members' bills. Um, so one does begin to wonder sometimes if we could have slightly um, different names for these things. But they're bills which um, um, are to do with a private interest, and there aren't very many of them. Um, there's one before the House at the moment about Highgate Cemetery. Um, so they're matters which aren't um, um, relevant to the nation at large. They're, they are bills to do with private interests. And then hybrid bills. Um, I promised you this would be esoteric and we, we, we've hit hybridity and I'm only about four minutes in. Um, hybrid bills are a mixture of public bills and private bills. So they're bills where there is a, there is a national interest, um, but also certain sections of the population um, are affected by the piece of legislation more than others. So the most well-known examples of hybrid bills are the bills to do with HS2. Um, so whilst it is a government, um, plan to have a high-speed rail network which everybody can use. Clearly, if you're on the proposed route, um, that bill affects you far more than if you're um, down in Cornwall um, or, or, or well away from the, from the line of, of where the, where the railway is going to go. Um, and that they have a quite a different system, but let's stick to, let's stick to the kind of main public bills for the, for the time being. But I'm always delighted to talk about hybrid bills. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, and I, something I um, do bore my friends with. Um, okay, run some sources of bills, like where do they sort of come from? Um, so we've alluded to some of this, but green papers and white papers may be promised legislation. So a green paper is a kind of initial policy document. Um, and then when it's fleshed out and there's more detail and certainty, it becomes a white paper. And a white paper, government white paper may promise that a bill will be brought forward. Um, there are bills promised in manifestos, as I mentioned, they can be promised in the Queen's speech, um, and there may be other sources such as an, uh, as an EU directive. Um, there are bill teams in government departments, usually about 10 to 12 strong, and their job is to get the bill through both houses and get it on the statute book. Um, and they also draw heavily on parliamentary council, um, who draft the bills and often draft government amendments, um, and generally kind of oversee all the kind of um, legal aspects. And private members' bills, as I mentioned, from backbench MPs, um, they, they can originate in both houses. But they don't give much time. And it's quite hard to get them on the statute book. And handout um, just applies to sometimes, it might be the case that government hand out what is essentially a government bill to a backbench member, um, just to ease um, parliamentary time. Um, or if it's a very kind of small, um, specific bill, um, it's felt a good idea to give, give it to a backbench member who's got a particular interest and let them um, pilot the bill through the houses. Um, this is just a little slide about um, devolution. Um, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, so it, it does slightly kind of undercut the idea of an entirely sovereign parliament, but um, I think it's now pretty well understood um, that the parliament would not legislate with regard to devolve matters without the consent of the um, devolved administrations. Um, okay, so the structure of a bill, and there's a little bit of um, text down here um, in the kind of commentary section, which explains it a little bit more, um, but it's basically, you know, it has a title, quite obviously, has a long title, which sets out the scope. It built clauses of what will become an act are, are known as clauses in a bill, they become sections once the bill becomes an act. Um, no one please ask me why, I've never really understood. Um, it also has lots of schedules which sit at the back of the bill where quite a lot of the detail is often found. And whenever any bill is introduced, you always get a human rights compatibility statement. And there's also explanatory notes prepared by the relevant government department, uh, which are very factual and just help to um, decode what the, what the bill is trying to achieve. Now, we'll skip on to this um, I maybe slightly confusing chart, but this is what we all use. Um, and it refers to the stages in both houses um, up to the, the point when the 
bill becomes law after it's got royal assent. Um, and they look similar, first reading, second reading, committee report, third, in both houses, but they're different in both houses. Some bills begin in the House of Commons and some begin in the House of Lords. That is business management as much as anything, because if you start them all in one house, then everything gets, um, you kind of have a log jam, so it's good to start them in, in different houses. More start in the Commons. You would expect controversial bills to start in the Commons just by um, an understanding the Commons should have the first go at it. Um, and in the end, the two houses have to agree exactly the same text of the bill for it to become law. And that's when you sometimes get into the process of what is known as ping pong, um, when the text of the bill um, moves between both houses until they can agree final text. Um, pretty complicated um, ping pong, can, um, it, it can be. Um, but, and there's a lot of kind of, um, um, negotiating um, behind the scenes to um, um, and, and concessions can be can be given to get to get the bill over the line um, let's have a thing about let's have a little look at Lord's powers um, they can introduce bills um, they scrutinize there's the Constitution Committee um, will always write a report on a government bill um, looking at the constitutional aspects of the bill, if any, and there's a delegated powers committee will look at the bill as well to see that it's um, it feels that the powers given to ministers under the proposed act are um, appropriate. Um, pre and post legislation we may return to, but um, that's kind of fairly detailed part of the process. So the lords can amend the bill; um, they do constantly. I was just looking in the 2016-17 session, for instance, there were thousands and thousands of amendments considered and about two and a half thousand of them were agreed. It might be government amendments and there might be opposition amendments. Um, it's pretty tricky to work out a kind of very, very clear cause and effect. Um, but by and large, I think the kind of main takeaway message would be, um, and this doesn't get picked up much, it doesn't get much attention, um, it's often quite boring work. Um, but crucial work is that bills do get um, amended regularly and heavily indeed um, in the House of Lords as it goes about its business of going through the bill line by line. Um, it's easier to amend bills in the Lords because obviously the government doesn't have a majority, it has nothing like a majority. Um, if Labour and Lib Dems and some of the independent crossbenchers vote together, the government invariably loses. Um, I think it, it, it can delay things and make the government think again. Um, rejecting a bill is something that it would think long, long and hard about before doing anything like that. Um, there are, the um, examples are very, very few and far between. And constitutionally, I think um, most members would think that um, outright rejecting something that has come from the Commons with the Commons mandate um, would be a, a pretty kind of nuclear option. But most of the time, um, the value is in amending the bill, sending it back to the Commons and saying, are you sure? Have you thought about this? What about that? And then the Commons can um, reflect on that and then either amend the bill or, sorry, agree with the amendment or send it back saying we don't agree. Um, okay, Lord Stages. Um, very straightforward. First reading is when the bill is introduced. Nothing happens. It's just read out that the bill's been introduced, although it's a little bit different at the moment because of the way the hybrid house is working. Second reading is about general principles of the bill. There's a speaker's list. Um, it's a big, long, long, long debate, um, depending on the, how big the bill is. And it's all about general principles. Um, committee stage is when you really get into the detail. And that's when amendments start getting tabled. And it's very, very um, sort of forensic examination of the bill line by line. They tend not to vote at that stage on amendments. They tend to use the committee stage to tease out arguments from the government, um, see what they think of them. And then at report stage is really when you get into the meat of divisions where they, uh, members have coalesced around an amendment or, or amendments or, and they feel as though the arguments they've heard previously um, have not been sufficient and they um, will force um, divisions at report stage. Um, it's similar in the Commons, but then this is quite a significant difference. Is that the third reading in the Commons and the Lords are, are really quite different. Um, we'll come more to third reading shortly. Um, 
And then, as I said, after third reading, you then get into um, ping pong. And next seminar refers is to um, not the next seminar of this particular group. I, I hate to inform you, but um, that's something I failed to delete um, when I was going through these slides, because um, these are all part of a series of seminars that we run internally. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'll keep skipping on. Please bear with me. I promised you esoterica. I hope I haven't disappointed. Okay, so there are intervals between bills, and that's to give basically so they don't get rushed through and everybody's got time to read them and think about them and be lobbied about them and receive submissions and draft amendments and all that sort of thing. Um, so there's two weekends between first and second reading, um, 14 days between second reading and committee stage. That's probably the most crucial part because that's when you've gone from general principles of second reading to the real detail of the committee stage. Um, and then on bills of considerable length and complexity, another 14 days between committee and report and three clear sitting days between report and third reading. Um, fundamentally, this is just to ensure that everyone has, uh, has enough time. So that's why things don't move um, at breakneck speed, but um, I think most members would say there's very strong arguments for having these minimum intervals. Sometimes um, minimum intervals can't happen if there's any kind of emergency legislation, um, often Northern, Ireland, I, Northern Irish legislation to do with the assembly or lack of, um, they, the bill stages get compressed um, very, very significantly. Um, okay, let's have a little bit of a talk about amendments. The Lords has enormous um, flexibility um, insofar as any member can participate um, and all amendments are called. They're not selected like they are in the House of Commons um, by and large. So there's a lot, there's a lot of freedom for members. Um, but there are some restrictions in that the amendment has to be about the bill and it has to be really quite tightly defined um, in terms of how it's about the bill. Otherwise, you have all sorts of amendments hanging off um, a piece of legislation um, which aren't with what we would call relevant or within scope. Um, amendments are printed every day and then before a committee stage or report stage, all the amendments are put into what's called a marshal list. Um, which is basically a, a kind of big overall uber running list of all the amendments um, in order as they come through the bill and when they're debated they're grouped which is to make good use of time um, so if you've got 10 amendments all about more or less the same thing they'll all be taken together rather than having to have 10 um, separate debates um, and that's a nice picture of the Moses room in the House of Lords which is a sort of it's like a parallel chamber so lots of legislation is dealt with them in the main chamber um, but just to free up time um, some legislation more uncontroversial legislation is dealt with in this sort of antechamber just it's just about 10 meters away from the main chamber um, it's a bit like if you know the commons it's a bit like Westminster Hall um, it's a kind of um, another way of taking another way of taking business um, committee stage, I've mentioned this a bit already, but just to, to skip through, any member can take part. It's very free. The House is self-regulating. Members can talk as many times as they want. Um, it's very discursive. Um, it, voting is rare because they wait for report stage. In grand committee, which is held in the Moses room, which we saw that nice picture of a few minutes ago, um, there are no, you, there's no ability to vote there, um, which is well understood. Report stage, um, amendments are identical or of identical effect to amendments pressed to a vote by the mover and defeating committee may not be retabled. So you can't reopen things where a decision has already been made, albeit I've just said that it is rare to vote at, um, at committee stage, but that's going to rule the debate. But report is where, report stage is where um, everybody gets organised and decide what they want to vote on um, and decide where they're going to keep their powder dry. Third reading, um, I think the slide says itself, but mainly it's for the purposes of tidying up, um, attending to the drafting. You might often get government amendments if parliamentary councillors notice something um, in the drafting that need, just needs um, some clarifying. But also it's quite important insofar as it enables the government to fulfil undertakings given at earlier stages. So a report stage, they might have said, remember um, 
we don't agree with the wording of your amendment, but in principle, we're supportive. Can we take it away and return with our own amendment at third reading? And that happens fairly frequently. So that's why third reading is very kind of useful for things to be um, swept up. So a few differences between Lords and Commons procedure. In the Lords, there's no formal programming. I mean, the Commons legislation is programmed, so the, it starts a certain time, it ends a certain time. There's no formal programming in the Lords. There's discussions amongst the usual channels, which is basically the whips of all the parties and the convener of the crossbench peers. And they work out amongst themselves and agree amongst themselves how much time broadly um, the bill's going to be um, um, scrutinised. And it, it's a negotiation and it's very informal. Um, and it relies on people just sort of being um, sensible and pragmatic about how long things might take. Um, there's no evidence taking stage as there is in the Commons, which is when, a bit like a select committee, when um, um, external um, um, interested parties come and give evidence um, to the Public Bill Committee in the Commons. Uh, they might be academics, um, practitioners in the field, all sorts of different people. Um, and they would come and give evidence. But that stage doesn't happen in the Lords, I think probably because it's probably thought it doesn't need to happen twice. If it's happened in the Commons, members can read what was said. Um, there's no selection of amendments, as I've already said, like the Commons. Third reading is done on a separate day in the Commons. It's done straight after report stage, and it's a very, very short debate. Um, and it being now deep into a Tuesday afternoon, I'm going to be bold and skip financial privilege and English votes for English laws and promise that um, if there is mass demand, we can return to those another day. Um, this is a, just a little bit about the Legislation Office and what they do, but there's an awful lot of work um, at official level um, to deal with all the different aspects of um, a bill passing through the House, um, including printing the bills, drafting private members' bills, um, working with the department to produce explanatory notes, talking to members about amendments and thinking about drafting and admissibility, um, and thinking about all the briefs you have to do for um, the government minister and for who's, on the, who's um, in the chair. Um, um, you, there's all sorts of things around amendments and preemption um, and duplication. It's an awful lot sort of happens, which it's, it's just never really seen um, in terms of the kind of machinery of, of bills progressing. Um, okay, good system, question mark. Um, this is just um, speculative. Um, I don't so, um, associate any great authority with this. Lots of people agree or disagree. Um, but the process is good insofar as it's iterative and it's a journey. The bill begins at set, um, and has its um, general principles debated at second reading and gradually through all the different stages um, it just gets a kind of fairly rigorous examination and unintended consequences emerge or things that um, hadn't been thought about um, emerge or there's some extremely useful lobbying and somebody just brings up something that just hadn't been thought about. Um, so in that way the kind of process um, in itself is, is valuable and I think flushes out difficulties. I'm sure not always um, but the, the very process and the way in which it's the timings of and the different stages just gives everyone a reasonable chance to ensure that by the time the bill becomes an act most things if not all things have had an airing. Um, it's on the record, it's in Hansard, you can read all of it um, at great great length or you can watch it back on Parliament TV and the outcomes are fairly clear when you have a, when you have a division um, and everyone's on the record so you can see what's um, intended if you're going to argue if it was a less good system, it can be quite repetitive. Um, it is sort of very textual legal. And when you're thinking about divisions, it becomes quite binary. You either agree with them or you don't agree with them. But I can't really think of any particular way um, around that. Um, so here's some lovely resources. Um, Lord's Whips um, has lots of information about speakers and groupings of amendments and forthcoming business. Um, there's a Parliament website which I'm sure you um, all are aware of 
and legislation.gov.uk and LexisNexis um, print. Um, you can find um, bills, you can find acts um, going back an awful long way. Um, there, um, I, I see all sorts of, there's been some chat, I don't know if there's any questions directed to me, but for the time being, um, thanks very much. Um, I hope that was a kind of useful canter through the kind of main um, foliage of, of public bills and, and the House of Lords and, and thank you very, very much. I will now stop sharing my screen and you will all be pleased to know I will mute myself and also take a breath. Brilliant, thank you ever so much, Chris. Um, presuming that everybody can hear me, we will now move to, to take some questions. And we have one question in our Q&A box so far from Ian Clark. And the question's for you, Chris. Um, and Ian says, Chris mentioned EU directives in relation to the ways a government bill can be introduced. Given we have left the EU, but are in a negotiation period, are these directives still influencing bills? Or if not, are they on a time scale until they completely end? Yes, um, good question. That example is because these spies are a little bit um, old, um, just a year or two. Um, and EU directors in the past have given rise to, to, to bills which have become acts, um, but I can't envisage that that's going to be the case um, any longer. In fact, I can't think of anything before the House at the moment which is um, anything to do with an EU directive. So I'm afraid that's a little bit of, um, that's a kind of historical footnote um, in this presentation. and. Um, I think um, that ship has sailed in terms of EU directives. Brilliant, thank you, Chris. Um, I think somebody else is, is in the process of typing a question. Um, Chris Liston has said hello. Hopefully there's a follow-up to, to that. Oh, here we go. A another question for Chris. Is there a way of gauging how much influence the Lords has on legislation through informal channels, discussions, conventions, etc.? Brilliant question. It's one that we worry about all the time. The Constitution Unit um, at UCL have done a lot of work on this. Um, lots of it's led by uh, Professor Meg Russell. Um, it's really, really hard to measure outputs because if you think of the collision of factors in a minister's mind when they're making a, a policy choice, um, there's so many different forces um, um, and things coming from all sorts of different places. And sometimes the Lords amend a bill and you think to yourself, would the government have amended it anyway or were they pushing at an open door um or have they really made the government do something they probably didn't want to do so i mean the, the long and the short of it is it's really really difficult to to work out and it's not um a very things don't move in straight lines and working out causality is very 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 tricky i suppose what i would say if i was trying to say something more helpful is that lots and lots of amendments do get passed and lots of them are government amendments. Um, much of it depends on the nature of the parliamentary arithmetic. I think someone once said politics is about counting. Um, but in previous sessions where um, the government had a tiny majority or no majority, then that gives the Lords a lot more leverage um, um, to, to get changes made because the Commons wouldn't want to go through endless um, whipping and difficulties with their own members. Um, it's a bit quite still quite early in this session um, I know that it began in January, but we've been so disrupted. Um, but with a solid Commons majority of 80, um, then I think it's probably the case that it's going to be trickier for um, the Lords to get their amendments to stick. Um, but really good question, one that we worry about and end up um, kind of um, tying ourselves up in knots about trying to just work out. Um, if you look at a bill beginning from beginning to end, um, it's a muddy footpath, footpath by the time you get to Royal Ascent, um, so it's a, it's a hard thing to untangle, but um, many thanks and apologies for that sort of not really a very good answer. That, that's brilliant, thank you Chris. Um, and I would reiterate that if you want more information on academic studies of uh, the, the kind of informal influence of select committees or the House of Lords, have a look at Meg Russell's work, lots of it's open access. Um, she had one study that looked at uh, amendments from select committees, so not the Lords, but select committees um, and, and proposals they made dating over a period of 10 years. And she comes up with six or seven ways in which 
select committees or other actors have informal influences on the legislative process. So take a look at that. Um, before I ask the next question that's come up in our Q&A box for Chris, I've got one for, for Nikki as well. And I wondered, Nikki, in your uh, experience of um, interviewing MPs directly, um, obviously you've, you know, you've come across a lot of barriers to effective communication between MPs and constituents and to the, the, the transfer of citizens' interest through into the legislative process. Yeah. But I wonder, in, in your opinion, how responsive do MPs actually want to be? How many of them see themselves as, uh, as constituency MPs, um, if, if you will, that are looking to take citizens' interests and put them into the House? Or do they have different ideas? That's a really great question, because I think over the experience of, you know, being able to shadow MPs, but also interview them, I was able to kind of see what they said they were doing versus like what they were actually doing. And what I noticed, I think in general, especially with the newer MPs, um, so I had a range of MPs who were more veteran, and then there were a few that were recently elected when I was shadowing them. And I feel like the ones who were quite new um, were quite, you know, were very keen on actually trying to get that, you know, whatever that was being said on the ground um, across, mostly because I think they felt like they wanted to be, in their own words, like the MPs that they never had. And that was the kind of um, work that they wanted to be doing. I'm not saying that the MPs who are veteran um, didn't necessarily feel that way, but I think uh, some of them actually had um, portfolios and other responsibilities. And unfortunately, like sometimes I think that might have overshadowed some of the things that they were actually able to do on the ground and bringing that um, to, you know, through the process of actually legislation and things like that. Um, and I think that's the kind of understanding I got with the new MPs as well, like that that's where they wanted to um, put their energies towards. Okay, so if there's, a, if there's a potentially a reluctance or an inability to act on citizen interests, yeah. what would you recommend to our audience as, as the area uh, to study when it comes to, for example, successful lobbying efforts? Is it the petition system and the, and the, and the Commons online petition system, or is it more of a focus on the media? What would you suggest? I think, well, that's a, I think at the moment, especially at a time where we can't probably go see what MPs are doing in real life, I think the petitioning online, for example, especially with the government um, petition site might be an interesting way to understand what's actually being raised as an issue. But with individual MPs, like it, I feel like it is not just an understanding of what the general um, public might be feeling, but in various constituencies there are going to be different con like concerns for instance there was an mp that i shadowed uh, in um i spoke to in court from cornwall and there is a very high rate of unemployment especially amongst the youth there so a lot of the issues there were about trying to engage with younger people giving them opportunities to have you know internships um really trying to engage with um, schools and technical colleges to try to give them opportunities to work with um, different businesses and things like that so that's very specific to areas like that and I think it's worth looking at different constituencies and what the kind of problems they might be facing and looking at the kind of policies that those MPs are then actually um, raising you know because that would be the kind of thing that would interest them and engage with them so I I would probably be more interested um, or suggest that it might be more interesting to look at specific MPs and the kind of areas that they represent and the kind of problems that those areas actually are facing um, rather than something like very generic like online and things like that. Yeah. Brilliant and that might be a really interesting way for, for some of our, our, our listeners and their students to study some of the dynamics of the principal okay. agent relationship. You know, to what extent are MPs really responsive to, to local issues and local demands. Exactly. Brilliant. We're going to move on to the next question in our Q&A box which is for Chris. Um, and this question comes from an anonymous attendee who says that the advantage of the House of Lords is that it's an iterative process, um, but the disadvantage is that it can often be repetitive. What's the difference? Very good question. <laughs> um, I think inevitably, if you have a good iterative process and you ensure that everything gets a really good airing um, and is rigorously thought about, then inevitably there's going to be some repetition. Um, but equally, it might be the case sometimes you think the repetition goes, um, it's a bit too pronounced, but no, it's, it's a good question and there's definitely an overlap and there's, there's a tension there. Um, you're absolutely right to identify that. 
um, and, and possibly the same anonymous attendee has said that uh, in the United States, um, there is a stat that about two to three percent of legislation passes and becomes law. Do we have a similar statistic for the UK? Um, and they imagine it's significantly higher. I don't know if you know the answer to that, Chris. I, I don't have a number off the top of my head, um, but it's, what, it, it's, a, it's a good question worth finding out. Um, we can bring that back to the next webinar. Absolutely, very good question. It must be higher, I would have thought, but um, um, I've, I'm not, it's, it's not a number I've ever seen, but um, that's something that I can, I can take away. Thank you. Brilliant. So we've got time um, for a few more questions. If anyone would like to post them in our Q&A box. Um, if not, I'm going to ask the, the speakers themselves whether they had any questions for each other. Mm -hmm. um, I think someone asked me this question online, but I feel like this is a question I would like to ask Chris because, you know, I, I don't know if it's something that he might have the answer to, but are there actually any trends that you observe in your work around the kind of um, bills uh, when, when people try to lobby MPs and the Lords? Um, Sorry. I don't. I don't think so. Particularly, um, I think members are lobbied ever more. Mm -hmm. um, I think their, their their inboxes and their their mail are teeming with people making representations, and there's absolutely no shortage of um, desire um, from external bodies to um, make their voices heard. Um, you'd need to ask someone um, with more closer to it than me, or ideally members themselves, how they feel about the extent to which they're being. Um, lobbied and whether or not it's escalated in recent years. Um, yeah. We, we've got another question that's come in, this one from Russell Deacon, um, who says that we also cover Welsh politics mm -hmm. uh, uh, in school. Um, do you know how, if at all, the Lord's processes interact with the Senate? And I presume this question is to Chris. Um, I, 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 I think there's little formal interaction. Um, the Senate's procedures, um, I'm not very well aware of, um, but the, there's, I mean, we do speak to the Assembly, obviously, from time to time, um, but no, the, the, there's no formal mechanisms between the House of Lords and the, and the Senate that I'm aware of. Thank you, Chris. Um, and, and one to Nikki um, from Stuart Baker, who asks, what amount of online communication to MPs is abusive or attacking their views? Um, and I guess here, Nikki, you might refer to the studies by um yeah, yeah. i thought i was about to say that i think that's a really good question um one of uh, the some of the work done by our colleague sophia uh, which i will link in the chat later um actually finds that a lot of the abuse tends to be towards women um and well at least the mps that i've actually shadowed and interviewed they do experience a lot of this but um, some of them actually have mentioned it. Some of it can be quite physical. So one of them has actually been worried because he has been asked, I think, or attacked, or like not necessarily physically attacked, but been trailed by the constituents in their constituency because they saw them tweeting about where their whereabouts were and what they were doing. So um, they've actually had to alter some of their actual behavior online so that they felt like they were safe especially because they had children and um, you know a lot of their information on public records so one of the things that they actually altered was at, um, posting only after events had taken place so instead of saying I'm currently at this place at this time which I think you know in general they would publicize but they wouldn't publicize it too much on their social media they would then post some pictures after it was over just so that they felt like um, they were able to feel safe after as well. So um, I actually don't know how much Sophia has done in terms of publications with that, but I do know that she has found that most women tend to be uh, bear the brunt of um, the abuse online. Yeah, and this also dissuades more female candidates from actually uh, running as well. That's one of the other findings. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you, Nikki. Um, we've got another question uh, again from an anonymous attendee who asks, Chris, do you think the House of Lords will ever undergo reform? And if so, what do you think the nature of such reform will be or the effect it will have on fu the future legislative process? So just a small question there for you, Chris. Uh, <laughs> what do you make Thank of you that? very much. Thank you. Very, I'm absolutely astonished we've managed to get an hour in without this um, question coming up earlier. Um, and it's a, it's a perennial question. And I'll be very careful about what I say um, 
unless I want to be uh, get myself into into some considerable hot water. Um, there are always reform repro proposals floating around. Um, I have been ever since I've been working in the house, and they've been there long, long, long since before. The last kind of biggish attempt was Nick Clegg's bill when he was the um, in the coalition government, um, and that was to introduce um, an elected element at least, and that never made its way out of the House of Commons. Um, it was in 1999, um, Blair's first government, when the, probably the last kind of really quite significant um, reform passed through and that got rid of all but 92 hereditary peers. Um, since then there's been bits and pieces like there's now capacity for members to retire, um, but it's a perennial, perennial um, subject, um, again something that Meg Russell at Constitution Unit writes about quite a lot. There's nothing really substantive um, on the table just at the moment, but um, I suspect it's it's the discussion that will 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 run and run. Um, and I, it's been um, it gets talked about on rainy afternoons. I think and people dust off their proposals. Um, the, the problem is, and this is a really simple point, but um, people don't agree. And if people don't agree, it's going to be quite hard to get something um, get something passed. There's a whole spectrum of opinion, um, and parties don't particularly um, agree altogether either. I mean, lots of elements of parties do, but there are um, there are outliers in, in this debate, um, and there's no consensus. And until you have some consensus, um, then the, the, the debate will doubtless rumble on. And would you say, Chris, in, in your opinion, is the House of Lords a valuable feature of the British legislative process at the moment? Yeah, um, no, absolutely. And it, it just does lots of really detailed, painstaking work, which it rarely makes its way into the kind of the press or the media. Lots of its committees get very, very good coverage. There's been good coverage this year of some big inquiries into um, social and economic impact of the gambling industry, for example, which is still getting a lot of coverage and is a big, big topic. Um, the Constitution Committee is, is highly regarded, as are the EU Committee in Economic Affairs, s and the list goes on. So there's a lot of very, very good detailed um, expert work happening and lots of the, um, in select committees. And in the, words, were in the world of bills, um, to go through bills um, deep into the night, line by line, um, when everyone's long since gone to bed, um, has to be valuable, I would have thought. Brilliant. Um, uh, another anonymous attendee has asked, Chris, um, what happened to the Salisbury Convention during the coalition government? Did the House of Lords transfer the principle from the winning party's manifesto to the coalition agreement? Was it something that much thought was given to? Gosh, that's a good question. I think that must have been probably what happened by default, even if it was never articulated as such, that they looked at the coalition agreement um, rather than the, the winning party's manifestos. Whether or not it was given much thought, um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, sorry, I, with everything that's happened in the last five years, um, the coalition government seems like an absolute lifetime ago. So sorry not to be able to recall or give you a better answer than that, but um, thank you. It absolutely does, doesn't it? Um, so much has happened. Uh, Nikki, maybe uh, another question for you. In your um, experience of, of interviewing MPs and thinking about lobbying and, and influencing legislative decisions. Can you think of any particularly successful um, examples of times that either MPs themselves have managed to influence the legislative process or when groups of citizens or individual citizens have affected it via uh, their representatives? Oh, that's a... <laughs> I'm not sure I, anything comes to mind at the moment, but they, what I do recall is um, one of the MPs actually telling me one of their success stories. I don't think it necessarily, um, you know, was passed, but it was actually discussed and they brought the constituents to parliament. But I believe it was um, the same uh, MP I was discussing in Cornwall who talked about a lot of his, uh, the businesses in Cornwall actually closing or being affected because there's just not that many people there. So um, quite a few pharmacists actually got together and uh, talked to him about why it was really important to maintain uh, local pharmacists in the area, especially if there weren't any clinics and things like that around, because that's where 
uh, you know, constituents and, you know, especially like elderly people and things like that were able to actually access their medication. Um, so he took it quite seriously because he realized it affected uh, more than just this group of people and their jobs, but, you know, the community at large and actually wrote, um, helped them with bringing their concerns to Parliament and have them meet the Minister um, of Health at the time to talk about it further and discuss it. So I, I don't, he didn't necessarily, you know, imply that it did pass anything else unsuccessfully, but what he did tell me was that he did take it very seriously because he realized there were larger implications than just the small group of people who came to talk to him about these things, which I think is what I meant earlier in my presentation about like impact versus just like hearing a lot of people, a lot of noise about a problem, but re recognizing that some of these issues that are being raised to them in some of these more local um, lobbying, smaller everyday experiences actually understand is to understand how it affects um, the society around them rather than just that group of people. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, invite any of our listeners to, to post a final question or two in the box now. Um, and I'll give you uh, a minute or so to do that. Um, and if there are no questions, then we can, we can draw the webinar to a close. So I'll give it 30 seconds or so and see if anyone has anything they'd like to ask. Can I just fill the 30 seconds with just a thought I'm inspired by what Nikki was saying? Absolutely. It's a really good, a really good example of something that happened fairly recently whereby law basically, um, which came from an individual person's circumstances, and when they lobbied really heavily for it and were, became, um, did excellent campaigning and um, media work, was the upskirting um, law, which was, became the, the Voyeurism okay. Offences Act 2019. And I've heard that woman speak whose name, I apologise, I can't remember now, but that really was an amazing example of one person um, being subjected to something that they found totally unacceptable yeah. and deciding to really lobby hard, campaign, get in the press, talk to MPs, talk to peers, talk to ministers, and um, it got royal assent. Yeah. Wow. I just looked it up. Um, Gina Martin, is that person? Is what putting it up? Amazing. That's right. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for, for yeah, uh, that, Chris. Um, oh, we have got a question. So we'll take this as our final question. Um, this one for Nikki. Is there any requirement for MPs or their teams to respond to communications from constituents? Mm. Could they theoretically never respond to anyone? Uh, I think they're, theoretically they don't have to, but they do. I, I think they, they aim to do that. Um, all the MPs that I have, uh, I, from my understanding, is that they make it a point um, to ensure that everyone gets a reply, even if it takes a longer time for them to respond. Um, so you, often you get an automatic response to say that your reply has been received, and then um, they do tend to reply to the constituents. I think it must, it's also very important to note that because there are so many ways you can get in touch with the MP now, especially um, on Facebook and Twitter, like I mentioned earlier, um, MPs tend to have to check that these people who are getting in touch are actually their constituents before they um, invite them to send an email or get in touch in other means. So um, it is something that they strive to do, even though it's not actually uh, something they're about, uh, like technically required to do, but they all tend to do that and get in touch. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Nikki. Um, so we seem to have exhausted uh, the questions from our Q&A box. Yeah. And with that, um, I would like to extend my thanks and the, and the thanks uh, of all of our listeners. Um, thanks from the, the PSA and the Parliamentary Education Service to you, Nikki, um, for your wonderful presentation on uh, influencing decisions. And also to you, Chris, for uh, guiding us expertly through the legislative process in the House of Lords. Um, so I wish all of you... Uh, the best of luck for the forthcoming semester and the rest of this term for those of you who are teaching in schools. And I look forward to seeing or hearing you either in person or online again at a future PSA event. Thank you so much, James and everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.